as the world begins to emerge from the cave of the 21st century and opens its eyes onto the suffering from centuries of injustice and the bastardization of what it means to be free, the new Nomos podcast is a call. A call for a new beginning. A call for the new men and the new women that yearn to be truly free. A call for us to fulfill our destiny. A call for a new Nomos on the earth. Welcome to the New Nomos Podcast. I'm Abdallah Dutton, inviting you to join me on this journey of discovery to define what the New Nomos is and what we need to get there. Hello and welcome back to the New Nomos Podcast. It's been a while since the release of the last episode because I've been busy completing the next stage of my journey with my coach, Rashad Ahmed. The same Rashad Ahmed from episode 3 on the heroic self and episode 27 on redefining conquest. Now, this stage has been the transition from coachee to coach. So I've been training under Rashad to learn his trade and recently completed my apprenticeship to become a certified coach under the Zen Coach brand using Rashad's unique methodology. And so if you're looking for a coach, a bit of guidance, or just clarity in this time of confusion, you can book a one-on-one trial session with me through Fiverr. I've added the link into the episode description, and we can take it from there. This episode continues on from the previous episode, exploring the idea of nobility to build characters for Ahmad Bilal's screenplay. And in particular, he wanted to explore the life of Robert Devereux, the second Earl of Essex, who was a contemporary of Christopher Marlowe, William Shakespeare, Queen Elizabeth I, among others. Lord Essex is one of my heroes, so this episode was such a pleasure to record. I don't want to talk too much because the body of what I want to say is in the episode, so... Without further ado, I present to you episode 33, Noble Characters in Search of an Author, Part 2, Lord Essex. I feel like the quality of of a screenplay comes down to your understanding of human nature and your understanding of of the characters. Uh, When you understand behavior and uh, in depth, you you can understand the the events that, that you know, or, or it just, or not justifies, but it, it makes sense of the events that occur to the individual mm-hmm. or the individual character uh, in, 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 in question. The point where I'm at now with the screenplay is I'm trying to, I'm trying to have bold characters instead of build a story. So by building the characters, a story will unfold mm-hmm. in the sense of because he has these certain qualities, what's going, what, situations are going to, going to bring those qualities into fruition, into, into flourish, where you can see them enacted in their fullest form. Um, so there are three characters. Yes. There's um, the one is based on Marlowe. His name is Marl, right? Okay. There's um, the other one, which is based on the Earl of Essex. His name is Rob. Right. His nickname is Sex, right? <laughs> it's all open to to, yes, to yes, be yes. changed you know this is just the no, i like it right so the, so then there's there's mal there's sex there's um and then there's the last guy which was going to be spear if if, it, if it's based off shakespeare okay but also people will call him will so every now and again you'll hear the nickname or you'll hear will or rob just to add a little hint to for the viewer to kind of if they're struggling to find the connection by well they might think oh, eventually they might realize oh well william shakespeare spear you know just to f- establish some kind of con- connection um because uh, partly i i feel like the films i really enjoy are films that, that you watch and you're forced to do research afterwards mm. you know those are the films i really love to watch and and recently i watched a film like that called um the lighthouse with uh 
brilliant, brilliant movie. Robert Pattinson. Yeah, Robert Pattinson and... Um, that is all mythology. It's all mythology. All mythology. You can't watch the movie and understand it fully if you, don't, if you haven't yeah. researched a little bit about the mythology that it's mm. based on, you know. And those are the movies I love. And because if there are other people out there like me who are going to watch a film and, 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 and it's going to compel them to do research, mm-hmm. this is the kind of effect I'd like to have with this, with, with, awesome. with this story, you know, which is awesome. it, I want people to, to ask questions. I yeah. want people to feel that, what was that about? Because after I watched The Lighthouse, it was like, what was that really about? Yeah. You know? like that's Because I could see there was more, mm. that I was lacking the context and I knew that I need to re- research this, you know. It's, I just want to recount my story of watching The Lighthouse mm. because it was right at the beginning of lockdown and we were all still not quite understanding what was going on. And a few friends of mine, you know, at that time in South Africa, there was heavy curfew. You know, everyone, you couldn't really be on the streets after I think it was like nine o'clock or something. And there was a group of us, maybe like five or six. And we just had a little WhatsApp group and we said, let's watch a film together separately. Yes. But then like have a conversation after it. Mm. And the film that was chosen was The Lighthouse. Mm. So we all watched it at the same time. We started it plus minus a minute or whatever it is. Yes. So we all ended the movie at the same time and then we had this discussion about it. And it was just monumental, monumental, tapping into all mm. the different mythology and mm. how this is that and the lighthouse and the light at the top of it and all the imagery, mm. symbolism, metaphors, etc., yes. etc., and exploring, exploring the, the mythology and the mythological themes mm. within the narrative. And it was, yes. it was wonderful in the at that time of separation Mm. there was this kind of very healthy expansive conversation Mm. that came out of Mm. it it was it was beautiful no i mean it's it's a breeding ground for for unpacking and just Mm, you know finding all sorts of meanings i mean i mean a lot of even as i as you 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 mentioning the film now i'm recalling certain themes you know certain themes are coming to my head and I'm thinking even just how much it relates to, to, to the discussion we're having, you know, in terms of like what the, the lighthouse represents, you mm-hmm. know, the, 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 that chamber in the lighthouse that the older man played by um, Willem Dafoe, yeah. he kind of keeps it to himself. He doesn't want, uh, you know, the younger, his assistant lighthouse keeper to, to even step into the chamber of the lighthouse, you know, and, and it's really made as this, this kind of Mount Olympus. It's like this heaven, you know, this like mm. threshold, you know, that, that, that this guy is kind of just keeping to himself, you know. The the two characters they they give you an older character and a younger man, kind of the younger man in his prime, in a sense of of age and and, and youthfulness and 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 and, and look, good looking looks. Where you have um you know the older man William Dafoe who's, who's who's seen his days, who's you know already you know he can't you know there's a big thing of he can't cope if he's not drunk, you know he can't be normal if he's not having a drink, you know. Um, so it's like this worn out, torn out man and this young, fresh man of, from the docks, you know. So a big part of it is in the, in the life of an indi- individual, specifically a man, is, is, is that trying to find the identity at that point as a young man and then also trying to redefine your identity as an older man, you know, because there are some men that have lost sight of who they are, even in their old age. The, the way they made the film is, 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 is they are mirrors for each other. Because for Willem Dafoe is where Robert Pattinson would be if he continued, you know, being a lighthouse keeper. And you know what I mean? He, that would where, that, that, that's where he would go. And Robert Pattinson is, 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 is Willem Dafoe. He, it, it re, he represents his past. He's, he has something that he's, did, he's done. Robert Pattinson has something that he's done that he's ashamed of. And the older man, Willem Dafoe, is lying about, his, about being a sailor. Mm. You know, so his he's, he's shame is that. His shame is that to this young man, he can't, he can't tell him a, a history about himself if it's not glorious. You know, if, if he wasn't this like st- sailor that traveled the world, sailed mm. the seven seas. And, you know, he, he's kind of trying to rehash the heydays and live in his glory. Right. You know? and, and it's about identity, ultimately, what the film is about. It's, it's, it's mm. about the, these, these two people who have lost sight of, of who they are. 
Mm. Uh, Robert Patterson is using a fake name when he comes there. You know, so it's it's all the, the, the again layers and layers. And layers, and layers you, look, yeah. you, I can go on about this film, you know, mm. honestly. But like, so coming back to Essex and Marlowe yes. and Shakespeare, what, what what is it that you are? What questions do you want answered, really? So so what I want to know is, I want to know why <laughs> why is the Earl of Essex on the cover of the interim is mine. Why was he chosen, right? First, first things first. Okay. That's my first question, right? Um, and then extending from there, after having answered why this man, I want, to, I want to be given some sort of context on the relationship that he had re, uh, with these other men, with Marlowe or with, or if there are actually men that were more closer to him, well, I think the why will answer that. Okay. Because it's part of who he was. Yes. Now, once again, I want to preface my why by saying it's my why. Mm. Um, I'm, I don't want to suppose that I know the why. Mm. I'm not the author. Yes. And it wasn't my choice to put him on the front of the book. But given my understanding and my study and my research of the book, I'll do my best to explain my understanding of it. Now, you can't understand Lord Essex without understanding the time in which he lived. And you can't understand the ethos and the style that he lived by without understanding what that style was and where it came from. Mm. So I'm going to try to do a bit of both. Now, why I think he's put on the cover, based on what's said in the book, is that Lord Essex was the last true upholder of the chivalric ethos. Now this is, and again, I'm going to explain what the chivalric ethos is, and it must be understood that this is not the chivalry that we hear about today the only thing that really remains of the concepts and ideas among it is this thing of like holding a door open for a woman to get yes. into the car etc yeah. etc et so it's, it's it's been narrowed down to the relationship between man and woman and this kind of the romantic aspect of chivalric love that was very prevalent in the Arthurian legends and the, the kind of stories of knights going off to battle and giving the woman a rose, which are all parts of chivalry, but it's like that's all that's kind of almost left. Yes, yes. Now, chivalry itself emerged in medieval Europe at the time of the Crusades. So this is a time when European powers were raising armies and sending them off to the Holy Lands, basically to fight the Muslims and conquer or take back or take control of Jerusalem, Yes, in essence. Jerusalem was the, was the goal, yeah. you know, to conquer, hold and rule Jerusalem. And it was this religious escapade driven by the papacy in Rome, and it was this great glorious battle that these knights went to fight. But what the history books don't tell us, and this is where it gets very mm. interesting, is that by these Europeans making this journey across Europe, and I'm talking Europeans, these are German knights, French knights, English knights, you know, they, 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 they journeyed, they traveled. In fighting these battles, and we got remember you got to go back to medieval warfare. Medieval warfare wasn't the same as modern warfare. There was still there was it was more of a it was almost like a sport. Mm. There was a nobility in war, and there was a, a I want that piece of land. I'm going to go and fight for it. It was a duel, but a duel with lots of people. Yes. You know? So these crusading armies that were coming from Europe, they were interacting with the Muslim armies. And there's a beautiful story that Salahuddin, in his army, or I mean in his entourage, 
were people that knew how to make this drink called sherbet. It was this sweet, cool drink that they had in the middle of the desert. Now, Richard I, who's one of the famous kings of England, famous crusader, Richard the Lionheart. Yes. He never met Salahuddin in person, but there's many accounts of the fact that he fell ill. And while he was ill, the only thing that he wanted was this drink, Sherbet. Imagine, I mean, you're sick, you have fever, you're in the middle of the... It's, it's just like the... Basically, it, it was all desert back then. And the only thing he wanted was this sweet, cool drink just to calm him down. So he sent one of his messengers to Salahuddin. And Salahuddin would send him every day a crate of Sherbet. Mm. Wow. This is the... The, the fineness the, the nobility the, mm. even within the yeah and this is, yeah this is warfare this is you know they're fighting each other and killing each other and fighting for what they believe in etc etc so would you say then in, in some way uh, being on the battlefield was kind of a sacred thing it was kind of protected it was against like disputes outside of battle you know outside of the battlefield i don't think it's so much about the battlefield as man I think man was understood as a sacred thing. Man understood there was something higher and something greater. And so you therefore lived by a certain code of conduct. Yes. And so I don't think you... And, and so because that was part of the life of the human creature, that when the human creature met each other on the battlefield, there was still that ethos. And of course, we're not saying that everyone was like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because of course, I mean, you take... 10,000 men, there's always going to be rogues, there's always going to be this one, there's always going to be that one. But among the higher strata of society and the governorship and the leadership, this was, it, was, it was prevalent and it was, it, was, it was part of the ethos. Yes. Now, the quintessential text on chivalry is a poem that describes the encounter of one of the officers or aristocrats or nobles of the crusading army that was captured by the army of Salahuddin. And in the interaction, it's been slightly morphed in the sense that the way that the poet has written this poem is that Salahuddin asked the knight to teach him chivalry. But given the fact that the Muslims at that time had high, high, high culture. And the medieval Europeans were living in abject squalor and dirt. And you can imagine how life was in a medieval village in, yes, yes. in England or France. The Muslims' armies, it was a moving, I want to say moving village, but it was a moving town, if not a moving city. You know, there was all of the logistics, there were tents, there were, you know, uh, water to do wudu and, and ablutions and maintain the cleanliness that is absolutely critical to the deen. So you can see within the Muslim encampment, there was society, there was life, and battle was just something that you did. So to hypothesize that it was the European knight teaching Salahuddin, mm. Is a bit presumptuous. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to use our intelligence to see that it was Salahuddin teaching the knight chivalry. Yes. And chivalry from its source, which is what well, you mentioned a couple of times, Futuwa, which is more than just chivalry, but, but we're, we're going to focus on chivalry. This ethos from the cross-fertilization, you can say, of the Muslim armies and the European armies. There was the exchange of prisoners. There was the exchange of um, people that were captured in the battles. There was, there was, a, there was interaction. It wasn't that there was this, some foreign thing that they had no connection to. It was they knew who their enemy was, both sides. And they knew what they abided by and how they lived their life. And so these nobles from Europe, they saw what Salah Hadin had, and they saw the, 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 the ethos among the soldiers of his army. And this ethos would become the ethos of chivalry. 
And there come, so again, it comes back to what was it? And it can only be seen when you look into the study of it and you look into the different aspects of chivalry that later became this kind of uh, re- semi-religious or later Catholicism was almost forced onto it. And now if you look at the, the Romantic period, there is, you could say, an essence of Christianity that's been superimposed on top of the what it was. But if you look at chivalry and you look at it and you look at the history of it and you and you do the research, it was something secular. It was something that was outside of Christianity. And it was something that acted in opposition and resistance to Christianity. And small examples are like coming back to the contemporary examples is how one treated women in the in, in the catholic church and in catholicism women were treated as these uh, you know vassals of the devil as the woman's there the evil temptress she's going to take you down to hell you know and so the woman was seen like that hence the celibacy of the priests now chivalry was completely against that the whole point the whole the the, the drive of chivalry is to protect those that need protection. So the women and the children were protected under this code of conduct. And they were seen for the human beings that they were. And the whole point of chivalry was to be able to sit and converse and engage with the woman, seeing her for who she is, not as some body of meat that you want to get in bed with. You see? So you, you, and that's a, a subtle thing, you know, and it's a, fine thing that needs to be nurtured in the self because the the passion within man the primal drive in man is something different you see you can say that chivalry it was a cult you could say it was the cult of chivalry it was a it was an ethos that you had to be initiated into and you were initiated into the band of brothers through battle. This whole thing of being knighted. Being knighted was your initiation into the chivalric brotherhood, into the chivalric cult, you could say. And there was a code that in accepting your initiation, you bought into. And that and that had a number of tenets. Honor loyalty generosity courage bravery and prowess is like being the best manifestation of who you can possibly be and if you were initiated into this circle you took on those rules you took on those rules for your life you took on those rules for your conduct you took on those rules for how you behaved in the world courtesy as well so those were the aspirations you could say within the cult of chivalry but then these things needed to be nurtured you had to these things need to be learned and nurtured and acted upon and so what was also critical to the within this cult of chivalry was i mean going to battle fighting going to war confronting yourself going to war with your brothers, acting courageously, acting with bravery. But it was, it was this ethos that drove men to be better men and to compete in being better men with their fellow men, their fellow men that were their brothers and they preferred their brothers over themselves and they wanted their brothers to be better because their brothers being better meant that their, their body was better. Yes. You know, so they wanted the other one to be more generous and 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 more brave and more courageous and you know this and the other and the reciprocal. So it was this constant drive between all of these uh, this body of men that were battle hardened, trained men existing in their highest potential, and whatever their shortfalls were, the brotherhood would would lift them up to be even better. And it was this ethos that drove 
the functioning society of i mean if you take england for example you see that one dynasty lasted from 1066 up until uh to the 1400s and what was it it was the 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 upper echelons of society lived by this code of conduct now leading this into lord essex in i can't remember the date but there was a the descendants of Edward III, so his grandsons, there were a number of claimants to the throne. Now, Edward III died very old. He was one of the longest ruling kings of England. And so the crown prince, the Edward the Black Prince, who was the, the one who was set up and basically would have become the king, died before his father. At which point there were a number of brothers that were extremely wealthy and extremely powerful, and two houses emerged, or two kind of separate branches of the family emerged, the House of York and the House of Lancaster. So these were led by the two, the Duke of York and the Duke of Lancaster, which were both sons of the king, both massively wealthy, huge standing armies, um, serious power, and they started fighting against each other, these two families. And that became known as the War of the Roses, and this lasted for a number of years, decades. And so the, 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 the crown went from the kind of House of Lancaster, the House of York, and kind of went back and forwards a little bit. Until Henry Tudor, who was the son of a Welsh lord, he had a claim to the throne via the House of Lancaster. And he came in and he... Oh, I can't remember the name of the battle. Oh, the Battle of Bosworth. I stand corrected, but I believe it was the Battle of Bosworth. He fought against the army of Richard III. Richard III was killed in battle. A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. And by right of conquest, Henry Tudor took the crown of England and became the king of England. The first thing he did was he married, he married Elizabeth of York. So she was the prominent lady of the york family so coming back to what we said earlier through that marriage he not only solidified his claim to the to the throne but he brought the two warring families together and de facto ended the wars of the roses yes and he even made the tudor rose was a red rose and the yorkist rose was a white rose and he brought them together with the marriage and the symbol of the king of england was this joint rose it was a red and white rose so he brought it all together symbolically and existentially and by marriage and he reawakened among his court the principles of chivalry and he to further solidify his claim to the throne he drew his ancestry from king arthur yes drawing on the the mythological kingly figures to solidify his claim to the throne and he reinstated this ethos of chivalry among the court among the nobles among the aristocracy so that there was this essence of competing in acts of greatness yes when he died he went to his son who was England's greatest king it was Henry VIII and he was a powerhouse and he took on this ethos of chivalry and he took it to another level and part of this thing was the practice of jousting jousting is a duel it's a chivalric pastime it's for the warrior to compete against another warrior in a on an equal level with honor and respect and the tournament, which is basically a mock battle where knights fight against each other, not to kill each other, but to to knock down. I mean, these are, imagine you've got 50 knights in shining armor against 50 knights in shining armor yeah. with their swords fighting. It was a mini battle. It was a mini war that was staged. And you wouldn't really, you wouldn't, I mean, maybe you got injured, you twisted your leg or something, but it wasn't to the death. Yes, it was yes. just you overpowered your opposition. 
it's basically a game of rugby yeah. <laughs> <laughs> without a ball instead okay. you have swords and these pastimes were were brought back and to to nourish and facilitate this ethos of chivalry what needs to be added into the equation here is that henry the eighth made the bold move of detaching from the church in rome this thing called the reformation i don't want to go too much into the details of it but he broke from the chains of papal tyranny and he became himself the head of the church of england so he took on both the political leadership and the religious leadership of the kingdom and what did he use to do that again it was this ethos of chivalry so that what the the bonding factor among the ruling elite of the country was not it was something was another religion religio meaning to to bond together it was this martial ethos of expansion and embetterment of your circle of people by the time the crown passed to his daughter elizabeth the the kingdom had been through a number of shakes so henry the 8th died and his son edward the 6th became king his, the son was quite sickly and he was very young he was I think he was 9 or 7 8 or 9 when he came to the throne and he was quite sickly and the 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 kingdom was ruled by his regents mm. when he was 16 he died and the only two other heirs to the throne were mary tudor who was catholic and her sister elizabeth who was a protestant so when mary tudor became queen she reinstated catholicism so we you see that the the, the king henry the 8th her father had kicked out the pope kicked out the pope's influence in the united kingdom she has reinstated catholicism she was known as bloody mary because of the amount of people she executed for heresy yeah and then she didn't have any, any children and she died and it went to her sister elizabeth, elizabeth yeah and elizabeth was protestant she came to the throne and reinstated protestantism but at this point one has to see that this ethos of chivalry that henry the 8th had instilled and had kind of tried to uphold was starting to fizzle with all this blood and death and religious change and all of these things the the, the kingdom was in a was in a very unstable condition and at this point elizabeth comes to the throne reinstates protestantism but below the surface there are political figures that are becoming more and more powerful in particular there's one man called lord burley who was a cecil and his family was cecil and he wormed his way into the queen's ear he represented a new ethos and his ethos was some was the counter argument to the ethos of chivalry his ethos was bureaucratic rule the rise of parliament political leadership as opposed to monarchic leadership and calling the shots from a central point rather than on the battlefield as in not on the battlefield so to speak in that sense but rather than from the front line so he represented the counter to essex now essex is born during elizabeth's reign and gradually he became the favorite of the queen this is a young man handsome battle hardened abiding by this ethos of chivalry and he was the talk of the town he was the queen's favorite he because he was the queen's favorite he was made the earl marshal of england this is the general of the armies but at the same time he was this force of nature he was, was sorry to cut you so was some like would you say somewhat unpredictable to to no. the queen or to to this to the no court? i would say it as um 
He was a force by his nature. Okay. Was it? What do you think it was? Because he ultimately he was. Is because this is. I'm sorry, but we get. I'm jumping the gun maybe no, a little no, please, bit. But yes. um, was it that ultimately his loyalty was always going to be to the chival- chivalric brotherhood? Like at some point he goes against the queen. Is it because he he, he still holds? holds to what the 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 to to chivalry like is he still he, he, he wants that philosophy to just... but what is one of the major tenets of chivalry loyalty loyalty yeah that's why I'm, that's it. I'm trying to understand the paradox there well there's no paradox mm. the queen says do this he does that he's loyal to the queen he's loyal to his monarch you know and at the same time the men around him are loyal to him and he's loyal to them I don't. There's no paradox at that point. Oh, okay. that, yes, I'm, I'm jumping the gun a little bit. Yeah, but let's see how at that. At that unfolds. point in his life, there's no parrot. There's he will do things that he doesn't want to do, but has been told he has to do that, and so yes. he does it. Okay, right. I mean, it's it's difficult to because there's so many layers as well because there's there's multiple things happening. There's a by because you have to un, you have to remember that Elizabeth the first was not married. Mm. So she was a queen without a husband. So the role of the favorite at court was this kind of dual reality of an example of chivalric love in that it's like what we were mentioning about that you can love a woman without jumping in bed with her. Yes, yes. But at the same time, it was this kind of weird romantic Mm. thing where why it was tainted is the man wasn't there out of love the man was out of there out of authority the queen was the queen she was the monarch she was the powerhouse she was the central power figure so he was the man and especially in the case of essex he wasn't there because he loved her he was there because she had authority over him yes so it's not the same thing so it's a, it's a show of the romantic love but the reality of it under the surface was this weird kind of political mm. thing mm. And he, it was like, it was something that was acted. It was a role that was played at mm, court. I see. So that other people saw it in a certain light. In a certain way. political, very... Mm. But Essex himself was a warrior scholar. His drive in life was to be on the battlefield. He wanted to be on the battlefield where he could test himself and test his men and test, push himself to his highest possibilities. And... Every time that he went to war, Queen Elizabeth would have a huge fit and go into a rage. And no, da, 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 da. she didn't want him to leave because of this weird romantic yes. aspect. And then when he'd come back from war, it was this great big celebration. Oh, the favorite is back. Oh, Lord Essex, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so Essex had to live through this horrendous thing. Mm. I mean, what he, what he was doing was creating a, a, a body a brotherhood, a chivalric brotherhood of battle-hardened individuals where you were knighted on the battlefield for exceptional valor or whatever it was that you, you, you showed courage and bravery on the battlefield, you were knighted. Boom, you're now initiated into our circle. And the initiation was regardless of whether you were an earl or a duke or a baron or whatever it was. So the initiation was is not to be sir this or sir that, because you're already lord this and lord that. But the, the knighthood is to be initiated into that band of brothers. And you're now part of the circle. You're part of this brotherhood that lives and aspires to these certain tenants that we mentioned earlier. And this is who Essex was. And he was noble by his behavior, by his actions, by his aspirations, by his yearning. And he was the, you could say, he was the most noble of the nobles. Mm. Because they all look to him as the leader. They all look to him as the greatest embodiment of these principles and of this ethos and of this essence. And, you know, a number of events occurred and this, that, and the other. And at one point, and this is towards the end of his, what would, I mean, I mean, you have to understand, this man at this point is in his early 30s. So he's not old. It's towards the end of his life, but he's not old. And this event happens, and remember the queen is in her 60s. He's in court. Essex says something to the queen. She gets offended. She stands up. 
and she slaps him across the face. At which point he draws his sword. He takes. He goes to his. Oh, is that right about that? Actually, yeah. He pulls it out of the sheath. Right. At that point, the monarch had broken courtesy, had broken court principles, the how court was conducted. But Essex had drawn his sword, so he reciprocated. He'd done the same thing. Mm. But what was happening below the surface was that this lord had rejected his lover. He not rejected her, he'd uh, broken with her. Mm. And imagine the psychology of the Queen of England. Of course, yeah. How can you break up with me? I'm your queen. I'm your lover. I'm your romantic love. I'm this, that. It's all in the head. It's all mad. Mm, mm, mm. But he broke that. At which point there was a crack mm. and Cecil could now, who had the ear of the queen, mm. could work his way and worm his his counter chivalry, his modern situation, his this new way of acting, the first seeds planted of what would later become democracy and high capitalism and the banking system began there. In that moment. In that moment. And so Essex was sent off to Ireland while he was off on Ireland on this fighting a battle which he knew he would lose and he knew that meant that he was away from court so Cecil could work his things. And later he staged a, a, a coup on the Queen. It's highly likely that if Essex was successful, he would have become King of England. Mm. But it didn't happen. And the Cecils got word through their spy network of what was happening. They squished the revolution, uprising, whatever you want to call it. And Essex was sentenced to death. Mm. He was beheaded for treason. And that was the end of Essex. And with that was the end of chivalry. chivalry yeah. So so at what point um at what point do um because I I, 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 did, I understood from where, when I did my own research, I understood that he went to he was sent to, to Ireland. But then he 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 comes back against the the orders of the Queen. He comes back when he feels um, just correct me if I'm wrong, but he comes back because he feels anxious that you know all the, his enemies now. He while was, he's not there, he was angry. He was angry. It was like the, what he lived his life by, and what he knew political governance to be, and what he knew was beneficial for the people. What he knew was beneficial for men and women and children and society and the 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 healthy continuation of a healthy society was being ripped apart and this is a man he's a warrior scholar he was a scholar he was educated he was uh, he'd been to university in cambridge he'd created a a, a body of intellectuals around him i mean you mentioned marlow i mean in his circle was marlow you know one of the greatest playwrights that ever that ever uh, that ever lived you know, you've got the Earl of Southampton, who was the man who, who was the patron of Shakespeare. So he was the one who was paying for it. It's like in his circle were these giants, and they were giants of different walks of life, but they all were feeding off each other and lifting each other up. And Essex was the center of it. And these men were later known as the Essex men. They were his circle of people. Yes. And they were each and every one of them in their own right, magnificent, monumental. I mean, even you talk about Marlowe. Marlowe was a playwright, excellent playwright. He was also a spy, you know. He was also traveling around Europe and going into courts here, there, and, and reporting back and doing things. So they, were, they weren't this or that. They, were, they encompassed so much. Yes. These were huge, huge giants of, of their time. And they were his circle of people. And so those were the men that were around him. Those were the men that were he was engaging with. Those were the people that were loyal to him. Those were his 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 body of of men. They couldn't accept this madness that was sneaking in. They couldn't accept it. And for them, the death is just a stage of life. 
these men that have been on the battlefield, they've been fighting, you know, they live by a certain code of conduct, they live by this this ethos, and now this these rats are sneaking in and destroying this thing, and even th th this whole show of the favorite and this love at court and everything, which is like abhorrent to the man. Imagine he's having to play this disgusting role, and he's the Earl Marshal of England. He's the general of the army. He's Lord Essex. And this is the circle of people that he's engaging with. You know, and there are all these little, you, if you, when you look at the research of it, there's all these little squibbling squabbles about some other woman who is a handmaiden of the queen. And there's all these like silly, petty stuff that he was just not interested in at all. That's not interesting to a man of that nature. That's not interesting to a man of that caliber. Mm. And then, you know, all of this is building up, building up, building up until the point that the Queen slaps it. At which he said, I, I, he said, I would not take this even from Henry VIII himself. Mm. Saying like, if Henry VIII had got up and slapped me, I wouldn't take it. Who, who are you? The thing is, Henry VIII wouldn't have done that. Mm, yeah. But then he was also, Henry VIII was a man and she was a woman. So all of these different mm. aspects that play into it. Mm. But yeah, the, 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 he couldn't take it. And he went and fought and, and he died for it. He died for it, yeah. But death was something that is going to always happen. So for him, it didn't matter. It reminds me a bit of, so of Socrates in the sense of like, he, he also took, he, f he, he took his, his um, he stood for what he, what he believed in and he took it to the grave, you know. He didn't, he didn't uh, budge. And that is nobility. That's nobility. This is you, you live by your code of conduct because you live by your code of conduct and that's it if that means that you die for it then you die for it this is interesting because i've recently i've been doing i didn't even want to talk about this because it's it's, it's a it's a, my own research it's like a research project i'm doing as well um and it's 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 only to to educate myself on to where the the general uh, opinion of people are of, of namely the muslims in 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 in, in buka right and so I've like just been going around interviewing some local people, young and old, and I've done like three interviews so far. But the reason, the reason I'm, I'm doing it is because I'm, I'm trying to understand because all of these concepts that we're talking to, talking about, you know, I like to sometimes apply them to our, to our time, you know, and, <laughs> and if you take, if you want to speak, I mean, you know, uh, you know, we were discussing movies and, and, and novels and fantasy, you know, so it's like, if you want to create this hypothetical movie situation, this yeah. scene, right, around book up, right, you have one of the last uh, strongholds in the city of Muslims and of people of color that are, 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 are still close to the mountain and the sea and all of that, right? 100%. So I, a lot of the, the, some of the questions I've been asking these guys is like, what are the chances of you guys, of standing together and, um, because they, they're dealing with like gentrification and it's got all the local people freaked out about it, you know? And in one of the gentlemen, one of the older men I was chatting to already sounded uh, defeated. You know, he was like, there's no way there's, there's no way, like, if they come through here with caspers and, and, and vans and, 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 and military and, you know, what can we do? You know, they can, this is now, like, in an extreme situation. And I, and I, I said to this guy, I was like, yo, but, but at some point, you know, you, you, we, have to, we have to figure out when we're willing, willing to stand and die for the thing, you know, if, 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 if it means that much to us. And in, in, in history, if, if, if a stronghold of Muslims was threatened by anything, they would have stood together. They would have stood their ground and, and, and went to battle for it and they would have been willing to die. Let's just look at this event that you've kind of painted. Yeah. The Caspers arrive, mm. right? And you've got the entire book up with their phone on social media. Mm. That's apartheid. Yeah. Uh, they can't have that. Yeah, they you, can't you, do it. Yeah. You, you can't do that. You just, that's game over. That's end game. Yeah. Finish. That will, do, that that, will incite the uproar. And the reality is, if that happens, or if that was to happen, the whole of Mitchell's plane is in the book up. It yeah. can't happen. Yeah. Mm -mm. Yeah. No, no, no. They're never going to send the Caspers. Mm. Yeah, they can't. It's, it's a bad political move. You can't. You'll they lose, can't. You'll, they, you'll they can't. lose the majority. Yeah. They can't. And which political party is going to do that? This city is Muslim. Mm. The Muslims don't realize their power here. And they're still 
caught up on the this rule by ulama yes 29th night i was driving from the waterfront just uh, perpetually in the shell garage there on the corner by the promenade i got goosebumps you got 50,000 people there men women children all with their tables man caking no one can touch us yeah yeah but we're all bickering and being stupid and unintelligent and not seeing what it is obeying the ulama who are not in a position of political leadership they're in a position position of knowledge and they're all fighting with each other because they want to be more knowledgeable than the next one and you see it absolutely clearly it's like this this city is muslim the united kingdom is muslim my auntie sends a message on the family group in london they did an eid gaf 5000 people they've got an aerial shot of it it looks like something from hajj mm. finish but the islam has been destroyed islam has been actively attacked for over a century and uh, the other side of the man cakers oaks they're all with their palestinian flags okay yeah the muslims are being downtrodden there the muslims have been downtrodden there since the time of the crusades it's it's jerusalem has over the last 2000 years has moved hands i think it was 48 or 50 times the muslims conquered it the jews conquered it the christians conquered it bah, 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 bah. that place has always been contested it will always be contested end of story why you're carrying the palestinian flag. what is palestine palestine is not islam palestine is a country is a nation you might as well just be carrying your south african flag what who is raising the flag of islam because that's the only thing that matters and the one that raises that flag he will have success and maybe his success is death okay shab shahid you oh. were all going to die it's the same thing with essex yes okay he was beheaded but he didn't budge from what he believed in up until the last minute even the one of the um one of his companions or one of his uh one of his brotherhood they they uh, wrote a letter to him saying like just say sorry man just say sorry say you didn't mean it or whatever like that. and he replies it's an absolutely not why am i going to budge from what i believe in if that means i die for it then i die for it i'm going to die anyway what difference does it make if i do it now or later and then when you do die eventually you die for not what you believed in but for you know for what someone else believed in you died for cowardice and he says he says essex says it's beautiful he says if you die well you live forever but if you live in fear you die every day yo it's a powerful one to die well you live forever your memory lives you you, you lived but to live in fear you die every day mm. the little death every day that's who essex was and that's who all the greats were who whichever character or figure or the historical figure you want to look at greatness is that cicero people talk badly about cicero that he failed his he failed to reinstate the republic and caesar uh, mark antony had him executed yeah yeah when the when the man came to him he opened his chest so okay do it and he died we're all going to die why must that, why it means my my moments come now okay shab do what you got to do i'm not going to betray who i am mm. to live mm. then i'm not living yeah mm. that's it that's the worry Mm. that's freedom that's freedom yeah you live by your code of conduct because that's the code of conduct you've chosen thank you for listening to this episode of the new nomos podcast just to conclude this episode i just wanted to say that sometimes it can feel a bit overwhelming with all the injustice happening around us it can feel at times like there's no way out there's nothing that can be done but the reality is that while you may not be able to change the external you can change the internal and when you change your internal by extension you change your external so to wrap it all up in a nutshell the only way out is in
Thank you.